Angel and Menges, welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. Thank you so yeah, much. Morning. Yeah, good morning, guys. It's good to be with you this morning. Thank you. Good, appreciate it. It is the first Department of State employees that we've had on the podcast. So really looking forward to this and, and digging into more detail on what you guys do on a day-to-day basis. Sounds good. You've, you've got the best, by the way, between Mangus and I, that's, that's all you need from the State Department. <laughs> this is a one shot. That's it. No more, no more <laughs> podcasts. The only thing I'll pro- we'll probably have to do, we'll probably have to do a part two and a part three to get through everything, but we'll do our best. Yeah, no, we're happy to, to participate as much as you need. Brilliant. Well, again, again, for anybody that, that doesn't know you guys, give us a quick bio on your background. Um, and then once we get that, we'll get straight into what you do at the department. Mingus, go ahead and start. Yeah, my name is Mingus Wilson. I'm the, currently my position is as the office director for the Office of Cost Management, which effectively is the cost estimating that supports the Bureau's uh, overseas program. We also run value engineering and the risk management program through the Office of Cost Management. I have about, if I was fully staffed, I have about 40 people. I also have a, an administrative group of about another 10, so a total of about 50 people to support the, the program. Uh, my background, I'm a, a, a chartered quantity surveyor from the UK originally. I uh, came to the States in 1980, worked in various places, oil and gas, commercial sector, came into the government 25, 30 years ago, spent about nine, ten years on the project sites overseas and I've been back in Washington the last 20 years so but pretty much uh, gotten around construction management, cost estimating, contract management, that type of thing. Love it. That is a, that is a beat, I beat that, Angel. Uh, I don't know if I can beat that but uh, <laughs> so my, my name is Angel Dizon. I'm the managing director uh, here at OBO and so I'm responsible for project management uh, design management, with, which has all the architects and engineers, cost management, so Mingus and I work together, and then a special project uh, management group. Um, I started out as a consultant. Uh, you know, I was an architect uh, by training, and so was just doing design work and, and doing a whole bunch of, you know, aviation, doing office buildings. And then at some point in my career, I found embassy work, and I started doing that. And I fell in love with it because of the, the diversity of building typologies. So not only is there a, a chancery building, but there's also warehouses, there's residences, there's access pavilions. Um, there's a whole variety of different kinds of building types on one campus. And I just absolutely adored it. And then of course you add that into all the locations that we're in, we're in 291 locations. And so I just fell in love with the work. And then there's this responsibility of representing the United States, which I think is just unique in terms of uh, that work. And so uh, currently, uh, the department has about $20 billion of ongoing design and construction. Uh, That's probably more around the range, about 400, 500 projects. 50 of those are really kind of major new embassies and new consulates. Um, And I absolutely adore the work, and I'm I'm happy to talk to you about uh, what we've been doing. Brilliant. Um, well, Angel, while we're on you, just kind of give us an idea on a day-to-day basis. I mean, as MD, uh, we talked about it before. We've all got bosses. W- what's your day-to-day look like? I mean, what are you? Are you firefighting? Are you? What, are you dealing with the team? Are you bo- what, What's What's it look like? Yeah. So no, I, I don't. Uh, I don't do firefighting at all. So we have. You know, what I described with these other office directors. So there's about 450 people in our organization. That is a very narrow part of what we do, which is. The, the Bureau as a whole has got 1,200 people, and we have folks for every type of discipline, every kind of responsibility in that life cycle process. So in my organization, I really push down a lot of responsibility um, and, and, and make people like Mangus responsible for doing his job. And so I, I don't do firefighting. I don't do projects. Where I spend most of my time is on the future of, of our organization, trying to understand what will our work like what would our work look like in the future? Who should we be working with? Who should we be talking to? Um, and what kinds of innovation should we be in front of? And so that, that's where I spend all of my energy. It doesn't mean that a project doesn't come up that requires my attention. It's just that's not where I like to spend a lot of energy. So I, I spend my time doing this. Um, trying to find out what is industry doing, what are academics talking about, who are people we should be working with inside the organization, who are consultants we should be working with. And I spend all of my energy sort of doing that, but day-to-day sort of running of sort of project related stuff, that's the responsibility of the, that project management group, design management group, and, that, uh, and Mangus and this cost management group. 
Brilliant. And you touched on one thing there, and I'm going to get into it now with yourself, and then I'll, I'll transfer over to Menjis. But innovation, um, obviously, pre-construction podcast, we love talking about pre-construction technology and even technology in general. Obviously, your challenges are slightly different to other people's challenges that we have on the, the podcast. You're, you're, you're dealing with numerous different countries, different projects, different project types, different labor, different challenges, basically. How yeah. has innovation helped you and, and what are you most excited about what you're working on right now within innovation? Um, so we're all kind of struggling with the same kind of stuff. We were doing it in different locations and different kinds of building types, but there are some things that are going to be changing the built environment that are impact all of us, right? So population, you know, in, in, in the next 30 years, we're going to be adding a couple billion people, a big percentage of them are going to be over the age of, of 60. So the way that we do our work is going to be changing in that way. Um, they're all going to be moving to cities. So 75% of the population of the world's population is going to be in a city, you know, whether or not that's a mega city or another kind of city, but they're going to move to urban centers, which means in those locations, resources are going to get tight. And it's kind of what you started to hint at here a little bit uh, with, with labor. Uh, we're already facing that all over the world in terms of specialized skills uh, not being available where we need it to be. And so there's going to be stuff like food and water and power and those things that are going to get exacerbated by that. Climate is going to be impacting the way that we do, we work. Uh, 80% of us are going to impact some kind of climate issue. And if you look at what's kind of going on in the world, it is a huge impact to the operations of a business. And so the, there's things that we can do to prepare for that. And the last one, you, which you hit at was technology. It, it's just changing, right? So it is changing very, very fast. And so what the thing that I'm probably, I'm excited about a few things, but the thing that I'm most excited about is, is offsite manufacturing, because it's going to we're going to be able to, one, it's going to solve a, whole, a lot of our problems in terms of finding the workforce. We're going to have a, a workforce dedicated to this kind of stuff. And then we'll be able to ship that stuff out and assemble in a place where it doesn't have that kind of thing. We'll be able to invest in the United States because we're, we're doing that here. And then on the technology side, uh, there's things around artificial intelligence and robotics that I think will help us in that endeavor uh, so that we can produce these things probably a lot faster and a much better quality. It, it, we guess right now that we're probably gonna be around the same kind of price point, uh, but the quality will increase quite a, quite a bit because we're doing it in a factory here. And then um, we have a, a sense that we'll be able to improve schedule quite a bit if, if we're using the, we're leveraging the right kinds of techniques. So that's, that's kind of what we're spending our energy doing now. And it's not easy. It's gonna take time for, especially the government, but any organization to translate from traditional construction to a lot more of this off, off-site manufacturing. But that's what we're looking at. We're looking at 3D printing. Uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, different kinds of tiers of assembly on the off-site manufacturing side. Uh, but we, I think as owners, we have this opportunity to push, yeah. uh, push the construction industry. And that's kind of where we want to do is we kind of understand what the right move is and then really push uh, our consultants and contractors to drive towards something that we think would benefit not only us, but also the entire industry. Love it. Yeah. Great, great overview there. And then Menzi is, I mean, obviously on the cost management side of things, how does that kind of feed into to what you're looking at? Uh, I would imagine that trying to cost a project down the street in Washington is a lot easier than somewhere exotic or somewhere completely secluded. Um, how difficult is your job and how do you kind of get over the challenges? Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't see in front of my boss that my job is very difficult, but we've been doing <laughs> it for a long time. And uh, he, he's the arsonist. He's the one that lights the fires and we kind of put them out. <laughs> no, we, we have, uh, no, to your point, though, we have a lot of experience uh, in building in remote places. And so we collect data. Uh, our buildings, we have a kind of a finite inventory of building types and so we typically would deploy to build the same type of thing in different places so it's a question of just getting your head around the logistics and what the labour force might be in that country what has to come in from outside and what can be sourced locally there's a big US content obviously in the design uh, design of our buildings it's American specifications American architects that type of thing so we have a good idea what we're getting into uh, I don't know if that answers your question but yeah, uh, oh yeah but, absolutely yeah. Um, but we, we we, we do, you know, as Angel touched on, there are huge challenges. I think if you're watching the news this week, you've seen that, you know, climate and 
things like that have been the lesson have been violently brought home to us with widespread destruction in Kentucky and other places. That these are things that concern us greatly. We have a, a climate security and resilience initiative in place because we look at places around the globe we're subjected to you know volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, uh, coastal flooding, uh, and then there's the mega cities impact. We want we want to be good citizens and so we don't want to go into you know some poorly developed country and suck up all their electricity and, and consume all their fresh water so these kinds of challenges we try to build in how do we cost that out that that's a challenge it can be because a lot of these technologies are relatively new or the engineering solutions are, are not that well known uh, so how do we get that how do we make the business case for these things in terms of justifying the expense of the initial price that that would cost uh, vis-a-vis the life cycle analysis and the, the, the political benefits or the diplomatic benefits of, of doing that for that particular country so yeah uh, it's uh, uh, it's an interesting job but it really really is we we get into a lot of things we have a lot of discussions uh, we talk to a lot of interesting people we're trying to bring on technology to the fullest extent and to keep up with that. And not only that, but also to keep our people up to speed with the technology. It's one thing the technology exists, but getting your workforce trained to use that and to use it effectively is sometimes not that easy. <laughs> and, and Gareth, you know, one of the things I wanted to touch on what, what Manga said was that we do have sort of a finite palette of buildings and we we know what goes into them, right? We've done quite a few of them. We have a real strong understanding of the buildings and how they come together. What Mangus and a whole lot of other team members get to do is focus on the things we don't really understand. And it's kind of what you hinted at earlier is those specific locations. So what's different about building there? Yeah. And so we do this thing called the project development survey that, that gathers that kind of information. What's the labor force look like? You know, what services are available there? What are the cost of materials doing there? What are the challenges? Uh, you know, where's the access to ports and all these other kinds of things. Once you have a better understanding of that, that's where Mangus's group is able to better predict what those, what contractors might charge us in that particular location. And sometimes, you know, we're looking at what is the, um, what's the economic health of the country? What's the political environment like? What's the security posture look like? All of those things will influence the cost. So we'll have an understanding of what it costs to do the work. Yeah. And then in some cases we'll have to have, um, risks identified and costed so that we can start to look at those as spare, very specific kinds of issues for which we need to be prepared. Uh, but that's kind of where Mangus's team spends a lot of time. What does it mean to do business there? We know, we know what the projects are, but it's, it's doing in that location that's unique. Brilliant. And has there ever been a, a, like you've been given a location or a project and you've turned around and gone, oh, wow, this is very close to not being viable. Um, and and how, do, how, are we get, how are we going to get around this? Yeah, that, well, that, 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 that's every everyday experience. Yeah, <laughs> every it happens a lot. So what what ends up happening is we don't our our little tiny bureau of twelve hundred people that do, that do uh, the buildings. Um, we're not responsible for where. Right. So that's the department as a whole. We need a mission here. We need a mission here, whatever. So most of them, we have 291. Most of them are already established. And then in some cases, it's brand new. The country's new or whatever. And so one of the ones that we're looking at now is in Juba. So we're going back to Juba and there isn't a lot there. There is no infrastructure for water or for power. So we're trying to figure out or we're figuring it out, you know, what does it take to do business at that location? We probably wouldn't choose to be there, but diplomatically we need to be there. It's very difficult to do business there. And because there just isn't any kind of real infrastructure for us to draw upon. And that, so that's part of what Magnus is charged with. Is, you know, he had to develop estimates for that. In fact, that post in particular is actually a pretty large uh, post and also has tons of residences because every American that works there is going to have to be housed there. And so, you know, we're being thoughtful about, hey, let's not make bad decisions about materials because, you know, they're hard to get. Or let's be thoughtful about the, the, the palette of materials because we have to store everything that we put out there. But all of those things are going to consideration because it's not easy to build there. It's also not easy to maintain there. And so we have to make sure that we make smart decisions on the front end so that we're not you know, setting ourselves for failure as an organization in the long term because we can't maintain a facility that's overly complicated or, you know, technologically too advanced for uh, what's possible in that, in that locale. Very good. And that's a great example. So Men says, if we can take that particular project, because I would imagine places where you're more established, the costs are, are probably quite 
quite quite easily work out. But a project like that, I mean, how long does it stay within pre-construction or estimating or cost management before you turn around and go, right, we're ready to rock and roll here on site? Oh, probably two two years or so. Yeah. Uh, typically, we go with a design build procurement. So we would put together some kind of bridging documents that would go out for proposals in the successful contractor would finish the design. But in order to get the budget, as Angel mentioned, like Juba, for example, it's almost like a military operation. How do you get the stuff there? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the latest uh, iteration of that was we ship it to Mombasa, then it goes by train to Nairobi, then it goes on truck, 700 miles, one way, one way into Juba. Uh, and then we've got to see what size of the bridges and how wide the roads are. And then that truck has to come back empty. So how, what does that cost you? How many trucks does it take? And, you know, you know things like that. Or if the contractor wants to build, bring a batching plant in to do the concrete locally, you know. So all these kinds of things. Oh, where does the labour come from? Do we have to bring them in and build a camp for them? And all that. So we, we have to kind of get all that sort of stuff done. And, and then but at the time we, we get ready, we, we have to notify Congress that, that we need X millions of dollars to do this project, and we're asking them, and he, and he hold us to it before we've even got a, a pencil mark on a piece of paper to, to tell us what the design is. So we're working from the program only. Uh, so that, that's a challenge for us. Uh, so we got. Wow. A, Part. Yeah, we're, we're, we're developing that, that early estimate that we tell Congress that they want to hold us to when we're buying the site. So once we buy the site, we have to notify Congress, here's how much the building is going to cost. And that's where Mangus is. I don't know what it is exactly, but he's working some kind of magic behind a curtain that says, you know, based on what we understand today and certainly the information that we've gotten from that project development survey, we can establish this as a baseline with this amount of contingency uh, that we draw down. And then by the time we award, we're, we've hit our marks consistently. I think we're, I don't know. I actually don't have the number, but like in the last few awards, I think we've only been over our budget by a modest amount once out of like, 10 or 12. And so it doesn't mean we're inflating. I think that's the thing that Mangus, we're not inflating. He, he, one of his responsibilities is, is to predict what the market will charge us in those locations. And so not only all the stuff that he just talked about, but we also have to figure out, will we will get enough competition in there so that that will help to drive the number down? And so in a place like Juba, we probably won't. So that's being considered in his, um, but in his estimate as well. That's yeah. incredibly impressive. You think about yeah. the, the, the contractors in, based in the US doing design, build, uh, CM at risk, whatever it is. These guys are trying to get within 5%, 10%, and they're struggling. To be able to get into to so close with a conceptual estimate so early on when you just buy a site, that's uh, that's some serious numbers. Yeah, we, yeah. we had, uh, we, we had what, I think we had six major projects that we awarded this year and they were kind of delayed because of the pandemic. We weren't able to travel and stuff like that. We, you know, with all the supply chain disruptions and all that, we only had one that, that, that came over and we're not exactly certain that it was for other reasons other than, than, than the COVID and, and the supply chain issues. But the rest of them came in within the budgets and are not, not, the estimates weren't paddy. They came in within single digit percentages of where we were supposed to be and, and kind of in the middle of the pack of the bids. So right. we were well happy, pleased with that. Not right. sure what the future holds because of the you know, turmoil in the market and supply chain issues and other challenges that we face. But uh, we, we, we're we pretty proud of the work that we do. I think we do a fair job, yeah. And Menzies, another question, I mean, this is purely pre-construction estimating cost management. What technologies do you guys use? What How do you do your takeoffs, your bids? How, how do you gather information? How do you collaborate with the, and communicate with the, the contractors? We, we have a, a cost estimate software suite. Currently, we're using Sage Timberline with some other modifications that we've got that feeds into our building management information system. We've we've constructed, uh, to some extent, kind of models of the building so we can put in basic programmatic information even before we've got a site and that will come out with a fairly detailed estimate then we can take that what I call the planning estimate. We can then make changes for the selection of components, materials, systems, and, and develop that forward into what I would then call the project estimate when it starts to take shape. Once we have the architect on board, we give him a design to budget uh, that he's supposed to constrain his design to within that budget. And then we have milestone estimates delivered by his consultant that we compare to ours to reconcile to make sure that, that and, and validate that he's actually still within the budget. And that's what goes forward. And then we go out to bed and the market tells us if we got it right, we got it wrong. And as we just explained, we we have a fairly decent record of, of getting it right. Oh, yeah. Very hey, good. Mangus, 
Mangus, can you talk a little bit about our approach, either you know, that design to budget and using uniform at level one to help guide? Yeah, well, but typically what we've done in the past is we've given just a lump sum, you know, thou shalt design the building for, you know, 350 million or whatever that, that number is. I think we've found that there's greater utility if we can break that budget down, say, to uniform at level one, so that we then identify line item budgets for the components for, say, for the building envelope or for the mechanical. So that then allows the AE to give his sub-consultants to say, this is what you've got to design to. So it, it gives us, uh, I think, greater transparency and then we can see if somebody's in trouble what we can do to fix that whether it's to de-scope some of that that particular element that's causing the problem or to deploy perhaps if they can't do it you know some money from from reserve or contingency so and overall that's our kind of cost management strategy not completely there with it on all projects but on the major projects we're trying we're trying to get to that it seems that the architects and engineers they, they like that it, it's it's helpful it gives us it's able it enables us to focus on areas where we may be having a problem and so we don't get surprised down down the road i think when you give them one lump sum it becomes all things to all people yeah. And it's not clear what your share of that actually is. And so they'll all go off on their own and you won't get the answer until you've actually done the estimate. So time gets wasted. This is a better approach to it, in my opinion. Brilliant. And then on that as well, uh, I mean, is, is that something you developed yourself? I mean, do they do they feed into it? Um, do they do they take the numbers and then work with the numbers, come back to you, um, kind of negotiate? Or do you find that they come back and go, yeah, those numbers are are, are pretty spot on? Pretty much the combined would be spot on. Uh, as I say, we've only been using it for a couple of years or so. We don't have a whole lot of experience about how it's working out, uh, but it allows us to sort of capture if, you know, particularly if, say, building envelope, for example, is, is a favourite one. If there's a lot over too much architectural kind of creativity going into that, we could identify that quickly. Um, so we, 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 we developed the design to budget ourselves internally based on our historic analysis of projects that we've completed and saying, this is what we think you should be spending. You should, you, you should be able to reasonably meet our requirements for this particular project in that particular location for this much money. And here's how we think it should break down. And, right. and if you want to move some stuff around, we want to have a conversation with you about that. So we have some say in how, how it gets allocated. <laughs> And in Gareth, as you know, as, as owners, we want to invest our money in very specific kinds of places. And so these things have to be 50, 80 year buildings. So we know we have to invest in infrastructure, these other kinds of things, so that the buildings can flex and change with what other programmatic needs. And so we want that. So we make sure that we're getting that out of our architects and our engineers and we're investing in the right kinds of places. It doesn't mean that the buildings aren't going to be representational, uh, but I think providing some constraints around where we want to spend money is a good thing for everybody because uh, they know what's important to us and it, it, all of it is important. So we want to invest in the right place. Brilliant. And, and again, Angel, from, from your point of view, as an architect, qualified architect from Texas, where you graduated, how exciting is it being able to look at the architectural side of it? I mean, obviously you've got to keep the, the, the American feel, but obviously you've got to incorporate the culture of, of each different location. Um, how exciting is that and how, how, how much of an input do you have on that? It is the most exciting part of it. You know, like we had, we've had conversations with Congress and others about what does it mean to do an American embassy? You know, what does an American building look like? And there isn't a definition of what an American building should look like, but where we focus a lot of our energy is around the performance of the buildings, right? How they function. Um, that I think is very much American. You know, Americans are, are very functional people and they're very performative folks. So that's that's where we spend a lot of our energy. And so what you'll find in a lot of the work that we do is that those aesthetics are born from solving very, very complicated performative problems or solving very complicated functional problems. But it's born out of that. Um, it, it's been awesome. It's been really awesome. We, we work with some of the best architects in the world. We have some of the best architects as advisors. And so I I would put up our architectural program against any owner in the world. I, I think we're, we're really that great. In terms of, I have lots of interest in it, but like we had talked about before, it's not my job. So, you know, Oh, I'm sure you, you know, have a little that. peek. You have a little peek I at know, it. I, I, I take a peek, <laughs> and then you know, sometimes I'll take somebody out for a drink and have a little conversation with some of our staff about what or doesn't. But I try not to get in the way. We have we have real sharp people. I, I, you know, frankly, I think one of the things that you've talked about in other podcasts has been, you know, what what makes 
some of these uh, pre-construction strategies or approaches really successful. And for us, it's the people. You, you know, you hire the right people, they'll figure out how to solve the problems. You get the wrong people, you have to have a whole host of processes and procedures in order to execute at some level of expectation. But if you get the right people, which is what our our goal is you get the right people, then they figure out how to do things the right way. They're instantly collaborative because that's the people that you're hiring and it's what we're looking for. So when we do interviews for our staff, there's a small portion of that's your technical capability, but a lot of it is your behavioral uh, capacity. You know, how do you collaborate? You know, how do you, ch- you know, how do you handle challenges and those kinds of things? And if you find those right kinds of folks, this job is very, very easy. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding it more and more, guys, the, the angel that I'm done, man, is the, the soft skills is just as important as anything else in the culture right now. To be, yeah. to be honest with you, in most roles, and maybe men's is, will, will give us more information on this, but most roles you can train. I mean, it's good to have a little bit of a technical background, but the most of it you can learn on the spot, and especially with yeah. people as knowledgeable as men's is. Yeah, and that's it. Like, what Mangus has brought to our organization has been invaluable. And it's not because he's the the best at what he does, but he thinks a lot. He's very, very strategic and he's hired really wonderful people. So he set a vision for what he believes his cost management group could become uh, centered around a lot of data. And so he's hiring data scientists and these kinds of things. Um, But he is recruiting the right kinds of people. He's engaging with the right kinds of government partners or the right kind of industry professionals. He's doing wonderful stuff, but, but mostly because of what you described there is that's who he is. That's his, he's got really wonderful soft skills. And one of the things I like about working with him the most is he cares a lot about people. And so he's always preparing them and helping them develop professionally so that he can deliver, his office can deliver on the back end. But his, his organization is super crazy awesome. They've done a wonderful because of him. Yeah. You know, we've had a lot of people run cost, but uh, it is what it is today because of things. And the accent just adds, adds everything. It's sexier. It's just <laughs> much sexier. <laughs> Uh, Men's is quick one now. You, um, Angel just put it on there, on it there. The the data side of it, the the pre-construction data, the data scientists, the data um, engineers. I just did a, a podcast with the EVP down at Skanska, down in Raleigh, Steve Stout Hammer. Really, really interesting guy. They started gathering data, and and basically they were like a, they got seed money from Skanska internally to to basically build this data machine of historical data through all their projects and data points, various data points. Um, how long has the, the, the Bureau been involved in this? I mean, you've been there a long time. Were you spearheading this and how important has data been to, to your job? Well, it's becoming increasingly important. Uh, I, I didn't know about the Skanska thing. That's interesting because they obviously come to the same kind of conclusions. A, a few years ago, we had, uh, I can't remember, we used to use a kind of commercial database and then for some reason it, it started to get really expensive and this and that. Uh, so we said, well, what is kind of, you know, it, it has a particular aspect to it and a commercial database doesn't really help us. And so we had lying around the office, all those deliverables with all this cost information that was kind of lost to us and said, wait a minute, we could capture that. And so we, we came up with the idea that we would send up our own in, in our office, uh, our cost data group. And so we hired somebody that understood how to collect and analyze data. And we've been really, really impressed with the progress that we've made. And so we ultimately, we would like to be able to get electronic deliverables from the AEs in the format that we can use and capture. We would reconcile that to stuff we get back in from the bid information and stuff that we get through cost-loaded CPM schedules and all the rest of it. And so we're moving that in. But not only that, but we can do, I mean, the head of project manager will come to me, we're trying to make a best value award, and we can analyze a particular contractor on the last 10 projects and do a little scatter point. Say, if you award a contract to this guy, this is the expectation of what you're going to experience in cost and schedule growth. And it's pretty powerful because you get little visuals. So I think there's no limit to what we can do with this data. Um, We just have to collect it, synthesize it, and get it in a format and in a place where people can use it. So we're really excited about it, and we see a lot of possibilities. I think the Office of Cost uh, is rapidly becoming, for some of that stuff, at least to some of our uh, client offices, the repository and and the, the place to go to to get that information. Yeah, so one of the major things I think, and, and Angel, uh, he's looking to us in, in the Office of Cost Management to come, to be a more analytical group and to be able to look at 
that sings from a historical perspective and try to see what value that adds going forward to inform decisions, whether it's a risk-based thing or whether it's a particular design solution or some other stuff. Another thing that we're looking at is we want to get uh, maintainability and reliability and sustainability into our projects. And so there's this kind of life cycle costing a- aspect to it that we're also taking a bigger interest in uh, in order to get our so talk to me a little bit, bit more about that, Menzies, because that's the first time I've, I've heard of that. What's, what sort of stuff on the life cycle are you looking at? Well, reliability. I mean, if you introduce certain types of roofing systems, for example, or certain types of elevator systems, can we maintain those or do they deteriorate quickly under sunlight? Uh, I mean, are there, are there improvements that we could make? Maybe you spend a little bit more money in the beginning, but it, it's, uh, you know, you, you get more years out of that. So what we're trying to do is to get some feedback from the actual facilities and how do they actually perform? So are we are we designing to the standards that meet the reliability and maintainability that that, that, that we would want uh, so that for these things don't become maintenance and nightmares and that you're constantly replacing things and all that sort of stuff. So you want to get solid investment that, that operationally serves the need of the of the bureau. That's kind of where I go to that. And again, data, how, how do you know what's good? Well, you, you track it and you feed back. And so this is a long-term uh, project. We've got like facilities performance evaluations that we do where we've got a program going called Lifecycle Asset Management where we're trying to come in with some kind of structural thing that we would go out after the buildings have been commissioned that you know, yearly or by yearly intervals and, and measure to see if the buildings are actually performing the way they were designed to do in terms of, you know, energy consumption and, and other things like that. And then, and if these if they aren't, then why are they not? And what do we need to do to fix that? So we're constantly recycling all that thing through uh, to, to, to improve the product that we deliver for, for our client, which is our diplomats overseas. And it must be amazing for a contractor to come in and be able to work with you and understand and, and see all that data and basically compare and contrast. Do, do, is, is that is that how you collaborate yeah, you are? Maybe you should ask them, but uh, yeah. <laughs> reputation. No, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we, we do have contractors who do a lot of our work on a repeat basis and so yeah. obviously they've they've managed to figure this out and work with us and uh, you know and we're pretty much we're pleased with what we get how important is that from from a contractor point of view for them to be at the same level the same understanding of pre-construction data the same understanding of the the mission and the vision of the bureau um and then of course w- within technology as well like there's no point in hiring a gc if they're way way behind i mean three, four, five, six, seven years behind when it comes to data or, or technology. Um, does all that get taken into account bef- when, you, when you're selecting a contractor? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, the requirements are, are, are clear. I mean, if, if they're not understanding what our end goal is, then the, the chances of us coming together on the project are not that great, right? So to, the more experience that they have with us and the better they understand our requirements. Um, and our requirements are pretty stringent, so it's not everybody who comes on board and does a project for us, um, you know, is able to stick with it. We've had people come do one project and never come back. Our work is not easy. There's a there's huge security component. The logistics are difficult. It's, it's very, very risky for contractors. A lot of them, the bonding companies, won't even tolerate them to to, to, to bid our work. That, that's a challenge for us, actually, is to, is to maintain interest in our work. I mean, we, we think we have a really, really interesting program, but for people to put commercial, you know, to get into that and put themselves at risk commercially, it's, uh, it's, it could be daunting. And, and is it design build? Is the majority of it design? Is there any uh, GMP or CM at risk, or is it always design build? Well, for a long time, we've been doing design build with bridging. That's been our sort of bread and butter. Anything that we can do to collapse the, you know, the owner, the architect and the constructor in one place, the better for us. Because of the scale of our program and the variety of our work, we we see a a variety of different kinds of delivery methods being successful in the program. It's just about why you would pick one delivery method over the other. That's kind of the, the focus is making decisions about delivery methods that are suited for that particular kind of effort you know, like in, in some countries because of the way their laws are set up we're going to be doing design to build because they don't allow for this other kind of mechanism in other places because of the complexity of the security complexity or the historic nature of this we might go with a different kind of delivery method so it's really just kind of dependent on that but i think one of the things i wanted to follow up on with what you guys were talking about with uh, the contractor is it is a commitment right when you have all this domestic work that you can do why would you do the thing overseas that seems to be tough? And so what we have found is that the people that have been successful with us from a 
a consultant and a contractor perspective is because of a couple things. The first one is they have to be passionate about this work, right? They have to care about what we do in the same way that we do. That's what drives them to participate in, in the work that we do. And then they have to have perseverance because it's hard you, you are going to be met with a lot of challenges and hurdles. So if you care and you can persevere through some of the hardship, you have a shot at being successful. But what we have found for uh, especially construction contractors that have really kind of stuck with the program is they have developed their approach to construction around some of the challenges that we have, especially around logistics and providing a labor force overseas. That's kind of those, those two big areas. And then anybody, whether they have experience or not, is going to struggle in some locations because they're just tough places to work. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's a given. Everybody knows when they get involved in, in something that's not under the U.S. Um, umbrella locally, it's, it's going to be difficult. And as you say, it's, it's risk reward. You know, if, you, if you're going to and I'm sure some of these companies have strategically said, listen, we're either going to get involved in this. We're not going to dip our toe in and out. It's not something you dip your toe in and out. So, guys, yeah. what is the what's the most exciting things about working with the bureau? Because like like I said, it's all general contractors, architects, designers, subcontractors that's on this podcast. You guys are the first and probably the last because you guys are the best um, that's going to be on this. Um, tell us a little bit more about the, the softer things working with the Bureau. What, what what makes you get up in the morning and go, you know what? I love what I do. Well, I'll, I'll start. And if anybody has gone to our website and saw our buildings, the buildings are absolutely awesome. Yeah. But they're solving very, very complicated problems, especially around the environment, around climate, uh, there's very challenging sort of structural issues when you're trying to build things to blast. Uh, there's representational things and cultural things that are demanding on for anybody. Those are really cool things for anybody that's doing buildings. It's just cool stuff. The reality is that what's probably most awesome about our work isn't that, right? It's these other kinds of impacts that we're making all over the world that represent the United States that are probably more important. That's kind of what's so, sort of gets me up for sure. And, and they, we have this thing called the embassy effect that we have been spending a lot of time doing our understanding because once we build an embassy in a particular location, what is, what is really the impact of those kinds of things? So beyond the diplomatic platform, um, there are economic things that we are doing. 25 to 35% of our construction costs is go, going directly into that market. So we're buying labor and materials in there. You can imagine if you're putting, you know, 25 to 35% in London, that's pretty good. But if you do it in Ouagadougou, you know, if you do it in, um, in Nepal, that's a very different kind of a thing. You're really changing some communities that way. And then, of course, the businesses that develop, the real estate values that go up, we're a part of that economic engine. And there's it's huge. It's absolutely huge. And then the second one is environmental. There's a lot of things that we're doing in some countries where we are being very, very thoughtful about their resources, introducing to them technologies that they may not have seen in terms of water, energy uh, conservation. There's any of those variety of things that we can introduce into a community that, that they can get, they can really, I don't know, they can really take advantage of, right? They see the Americans doing it. And there is this, you know, this old quote from the 40s about good enough for government. And nowadays, good enough for government means it's kind of terrible, right? That it's not so good if it's good enough for government. But what it meant in the 40s was that it was it met this level of standard and rigor, that it was good enough for government, that it was probably good enough for the regular person. And that's what we're bringing back, that what we are doing in some of these communities, if it's good enough for the U.S. Embassy, it's good enough for y'all because we have checked it out. And the last one is is the social impacts we're making. that I can't, I can't tell you enough that how important it is we're in some really – challenging communities and we can change a whole lot about those communities because we're there. We, there are some places where we build and just because of our security posture alone, security in those communities are improving. We built a, we did this security upgrade in Juba just for lighting, but it was so impactful to the community that kids were coming to the embassy to do their homework because it was the one place that had consistent power and light. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, yeah. We have some people that we've worked with on a on a uh, construction project where there are locally employed staff out in the field and they end up becoming a senior foreign service person because we've introduced to them this this construction program. There's wonderful things that we're doing in the world. And, and it's, you know, if, if you think about a legacy, these buildings are really cool. They're pretty going to be pretty awesome to remember, but it's probably going to be 
the the most lasting impression for me is going to be the people that we've impacted either in their communities because we've done something wonderful that they get to benefit from whether it be public access a park or something like that or some other kind of infrastructure piece like a road or something that they benefit from um, or it's the people that have seen what we do fall in love with it and become a part of our program either inside uh, our organization or as a consultant to us and so uh, for me it's all about the people that are benefiting from the work that we do that that gets me up every day Serious satisfaction. Oh, awesome. Absolutely awesome. It's, as soon as I found it, I, I was mentioning to you earlier, Gareth, I, I was a consultant to OBO for about five or six years and just really enjoyed it. And in fact, I didn't want to work for the government. I thought it was a terrible idea to work for the government because there's so many bad stereotypes about it. Uh, but what you quickly realize is that if you want a really cool, innovative, kind of awesome government, you have to participate in it. And so no, that's what happened to me. Is I was like, I got in and I was like, I want to do something good. And that's what I know that Mangus does too. And a lot of other our folks is that they're in here to do something wonderful, you know, build a meaningful career that has impact. Um, and, and, and we we're a part of something that's really wonderful. And by the way, you've probably experienced this. I know Mangus has my parents said we all immigrated through an embassy. That first impression is important. Like People are choosing anyway. I mean, out of what, 200 countries, they can pick anywhere in the world to live and they pick ours. Yeah. And they've gone through one of our embassies and that impression, that experience can be great. And yeah. that's what our responsibility is to make sure that those are really wonderful experiences for the people that visit, certainly for the people that work there. Brilliant. Love it. Um, and, and and you mentioned there it's good enough government. I, I love that quote because if I'm just speaking with, I mean, we've only been on here 30 minutes, 35 minutes, main case, but what you guys are doing when it comes to cost and pre-construction data and, and estimating data, that just proves what you've just said because there's contractors in the US that only wish they had something set up like that, Mengis. I mean, what, what you're doing is incredible. Well, thanks for that. I mean, we've still got a ways to go. I'm not going to sit here and tell no. you that we've filled it all, but I, I think that we're on the right track with that. I, I've explained to guys from the DOD and stuff, for example, about what we're doing with our data group, at least what our vision for it is. Uh, and they thought, wow, that's that's really interesting because they ha we all have similar problems. And so if you're talking across different agencies, you'll find out that everybody's tackling the same types of challenges. And so if you can have this conversation, sharing of ideas, um, more yeah. than happy to do that. And that that's beneficial. But we really are very happy with the results that we've gotten from our data group so far because we, we can take it anywhere we like uh, and it, it helps us a lot. So we're really and it up and running, Mingus, if you don't mind me asking. Say again. How long is it up and running the data group? I've uh, had two years, two or three right years. Yeah, yeah we, we we kind of had the vision, and then it took us a long time to find the right person, and then we got uh, a very good data scientist who who come in because it's 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 an art in in and of itself. We we had all this stuff. How do you collect that? And and we're going to staff it up. I probably want it at one point to get a, a real um, serious cost estimate who can understands the bricks and sticks and all that stuff and sort all that stuff out. And I would want that group to become the repository of all cost information that that my office uses so that we're the same stuff and people are not developing their own stuff. We we, we keep it there. We 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 we. You know, you, you come there to, to access it. And we also do all this analytic stuff, which seems to be demand for that in other offices. Like I told you about the, the scatter plots, about individual performances and cost growth, schedule growth, all that kind of stuff. So it has a lot of potential. Brilliant. Well, there you are. It's a bit, no better yeah. platform to talk about getting a cost estimator on board. This goes out to 100,000 plus people and it's all pre-construction and estimators, junior, mid-level, senior. So if you want to work for Mendes, I'll, I'll put his yeah. details. In, in the, in the, in we're the we're always looking for talented people for sure. So, uh, yeah. Get but, in touch. But, but I have to say, and the reason I ask you about the how long have you been doing it for, with Steve Stouthammer, they started it in 2015, and he said only in year three did the senior executives in the C-suite really, really turn around and go, wow, no, now I understand. Because, again, we're not all as, as brainy as, as you are, but once once you start visually seeing it and seeing it in action, you can really turn around and go, wow, this this is going to be a game changer. No, I, but I think it's a trend. I think, you know, the, the technology and stuff to support it is there I think people are starting to understand you know follow the data follow the data if you want like you know you want to make decisions what's the data behind that is it, we, this business about like going with your gut we don't want to do that we, 
you know, that, that you know, strong personalities then start to take over. We're looking for data-driven decision-making process in the government. We have the responsibility to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money, and that goes back to the business we talked about before. We don't pad our estimates. We try to predict within a reasonable tolerance what we think that the, the building's going to cost, and we use the data to support that. That's that's kind of the bottom line of where we are with this. Yeah. And, and listen, I'll, I'll speak about it all day long. The, the future of construction is pre-construction. The future of pre-construction is talent and technology. Once you've got the technology and the data and you've got the talent then you're 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 in for a serious amount of success mm. yeah yeah you're right yeah guys this has been an absolute pleasure as i said and yeah. i was joking at the start i said there's going to have to be a part two and a part three to this and especially dubai i want to i want to find out how how uh, how, how close you come in is to that uh, <laughs> that number <laughs> oh yeah 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 i don't know i'd have to wait another year or so for that i think I, I, yeah, i'm yeah. not i'm not going anywhere i'm going to hold you to that okay <laughs> <laughs> no listen guys I want to I want to thank you very much um, this has been a real insight into the department what you guys do um, I mean it's it's completely blowing my mind so I know that there's going to be people listening to this that are going to say you know what I want to speak with Angel I want to speak with Mendez again do you mind or, or where's the best place to contact you or, or should I put what, what should I put in the, in the show notes yeah, uh, I mean, if, if you really want to know more about our organization, uh, you can put in obo-ea at state.gov. That's our external affairs group. So if you're a consultant, uh, that's a great place to start. There's capabilities, conversations where you can introduce your firm to us and we can do the same thing for you. And then for people that are looking for opportunity, that's also a good place. They head up our recruitment for us. And so this external affairs group then can take that information and then put it in the right place. And so that, you know, people that are interested in working with us either as a consultant or as an employee, uh, that's exactly the right place I'd be. Wonderful. Wonderful, guys. Well, listen, we're coming up to Christmas and a new year. I can't wait to get this one out live and, and publish it. Um, I want to thank you again for your time and I really look forward to it. Happy New Year. And we look forward to seeing what you're doing in 2022. Yeah, thanks, Gareth. Really appreciate it. Uh, you take care. Good talking to you. Thank you.